Hey, weavers, and welcome to this latest Dueling Rabbits Productions video. Today, we are going to talk about pattern leashes on the shaft draw loom, what they are, and how their arrangement both informs and constrains the patterns we can weave. For the practical demo in the second half of this video, with its tips and tricks for stress-free pattern shaft deployment, I'm going to draw examples from my current project, satin damask cloth, to cover the cases for books, old and new. First, a quick review of what we already know about pattern leashes. The pattern leashes can be found here, sitting behind the ground shafts inside the draw looms extension. Typically, each leash contains one repeat of the ground shaft threading. For five end satin damask, my five ground shafts are threaded straight. Each repeat travels back to one leash, in this case, five pattern heddles hung in a group and held together by a single lingo. When I raise a leash and cycle through my five treadles, a five by five thread warp emphasis square, which I call a unit, appears as pattern on the cloth I am weaving. If this is already kind of confusing, please see my earlier video, Drawloom Mechanics 101 where I lay out the way all of this works in exhaustive detail. On a shaft draw loom, the leashes can be hung in an infinite variety of arrangements on up to 50 pattern shafts. These arrangements can play an integral role in the design of the patterns we can weave, but with so many variables to consider, it can be a daunting exercise to figure out optimal deployment. I tend to start considering how I'm going to use my leashes when I'm designing my warp, taking into account the scale of my patterns, the flexibility I will require for different designs on the same warp, and the optimization of my pulls for efficient and accurate weaving. In my very humble opinion, understanding the ways these three factors relate to one another is the key to a happy shaft draw loom weaving experience. Let's consider these factors as they apply to a beloved setup of draw loom weavers everywhere, the repeated point arrangement over 10 pattern shafts. Repeated points look like this. The front of the loom is here, and each row represents a pattern shaft. Each black square represents a leash, which, depending on the ground cloth, could contain any number of warp ends. Starting from the back, we arrange our leashes on each shaft in turn until we get to the front of the pack, at which point we reverse our direction. Thus, on 10 pattern shafts, each repeat is 18 units wide, an immutable number unless we change our setup. Therefore, our warp would ideally contain some number of units or leashes divisible by 18, plus one extra for symmetry here. This will give us an all-over repeated pattern, 18 units wide, built around two points of vertical symmetry here and here. There are lots of reasons why this is a popular setup, particularly for new draw loom weavers. For one thing, it allows us easily to adjust the width of our warp. All we need to do is add or subtract repeats. Say I wanted to weave this cloth in 5N satin, I have 91 units total, 18 units times 5 repeats plus 1. Each leash contains 5 warp ends, 91 times 5 gives me a total of 455 ends. If I were to warp these 5 repeats in 8-2 cotton, my set would be around 12 ends per centimeter for a width of 38 centimeters or 15 inches in the reed. But if I were to weave this cloth in 16-2 cotton, my set would be 18 ends per centimeter for a width of only 25 centimeters in the reed. This is not a problem. If I were determined to have a 38 centimeter piece, I would just add two and a half repeats to my design and I'd be good to go. The scale of the design and the cloth would be different, of course, but the pattern would translate perfectly well. Ten pattern shafts provide a surprising amount of versatility to our designs, which can be easy and fun to imagine. We can mix and stack motifs for variety within a piece, and this is a very efficient setup that maximizes the effects of each pull because our pattern shafts automatically take care of the symmetry and repeats. <laughs> 
When we add shafts to our repeated points, we can increase the complexity of our designs. Here are 19 pattern shafts. Now our repeats are 36 units wide rather than 18, so on our same 15 inch warp the scale of our design will be different and will have fewer repeats. As we keep adding shafts, our design parameters shift and our pattern repeats can become more ornate. More than 30 pattern shafts encourage our repeat to become very complicated indeed, but may only allow one per warp. Repeated points are not the only option for threading pattern shafts. Let's go back to 10. If we do a straight threading across the warp, we can do away with our turning points, allowing us to weave smaller, asymmetrical motifs. If we change the direction of our straight threading, we can reverse our motifs whenever we choose. If we add sufficient pattern shafts, we can use a straight threading of our leashes to mimic the action of a single unit draw loom, albeit with a maximum of 50 units in most cases. This limits the width of our pieces, but frees us completely from the necessity of repeats or symmetry. A shaft draw loom's full potential is realized when we combine all these possibilities in creative ways. For example, the addition of just one or two shafts threaded separately allows us to add simple borders to our repeated point designs. We can arrange points of different depths to design panels and add wide borders. And we can combine single points, repeated points, straight threading, and other arrangements to maximize the complexity of the designs we can weave on the shafts at our disposal. In this design, for example, we're doing a lot with 38 pattern shafts. Large, repeated points allow the poles for the central panel of this piece to be selected quickly, covering the majority of the cloth with a symmetrical all-over pattern of bees. The eight stripes for the borders here and here are all on one shaft behind the points. One pull throughout is all that is needed for these stripes to be woven. The left-hand border consists of 11 units arranged in a single point for a symmetrical motif or motifs down the side. The 11 associated units on the right-hand side of the piece are threaded straight, allowing for lettering or asymmetrical designs as I choose. We just have to remember that once a leash is committed to a pattern shaft, it must be lifted together with every leash on the same shaft. For this design, for example, I dedicated these units to an inflexible arrangement in order to pull the fewest number of handles for the stripes on this very long shawl. If I'd wanted to use these leashes in different ways, I would have had to reorganize them on their shafts. Fortunately, this is a pretty easy thing to do, as we'll see a bit later on. Now, once the arrangement of our pattern leashes becomes complicated, their deployment starts to become challenging. Recall that we typically thread all our pattern leashes on a headling bar at the back of the loom, before threading our ground shafts, slaying our reed, and tying on. Then, with the warp tensioned, we transfer leashes to their designated pattern shafts using the mirrorhead method. I can tell you now, if I had to get all my leashes off one headling bar and onto 38 pattern shafts so they looked like this, it would take me days and I'd probably end up a wreck. Fortunately, we can avoid both these outcomes with a bit of forward planning. To examine ways in which we can make our lives a lot easier down the road, both in terms of planning designs and getting leashes onto their correct pattern shafts, I'd like to turn to an examination of my current draw loom project, which has one of the more complicated arrangements of pattern leashes I've ever attempted. My starting points for this project were the structure, 5 end satin, which I chose for its smoothness, and the yarn. 16-2 cotton because that's my go-to for everyday damask on the draw loom. The warp itself is a striped affair inspired by figured calamanco, wide stripes of bold color framed by narrow stripes of repeating contrasting colors. For ease of design, my wider stripes were warped in multiples of five ends and my narrow stripes, all destined for the X shaft because it was unlikely they would ever be lifted for pattern, were just five ends, or one leash each. 
Unusually, I had no idea what I was going to use the finished cloth for, so I wanted the design to be versatile. It made sense to include an odd number of blue stripes so one would appear in the center of the piece. I included the same number of orange stripes either side of the center, for flanking purposes. I wanted to have symmetrical designs in the orange stripes and planned pointed threading for those. For freedom of design in the blue stripes, I decided on straight threading. I wanted the central blue stripe to be figured differently from the rest, so its leashes needed to be separate. I settled on nine leashes for the orange stripes and 12 leashes for the blue stripes, as I felt this gave me a pleasing scale for my designs. I set to work with Fiberworks to determine the lift plan for my first piece. You can see that the central blue stripe is different from the others, and that the two blue stripes on each side are mirrored towards the center. The designs in the orange stripe are symmetrical. The remaining leashes are not lifted for pattern. At this point, with my warp beamed and my first design at the ready, it was time to think about threading my pattern leashes, which brings me to my first tip of the day. Plan the deployment of pattern leashes before hanging the pattern heddles for threading. The main objective here is to figure out the best way to organize leashes at the back of the loom so they can be moved in a stress-free manner to their pattern shafts later on. I rarely use only one headling bar and often combine headling bars and pattern shafts to avoid confusion down the road. In this case, I saw that my heddles could easily be divided into three groups, the blue stripes at the front, the orange stripes next, and the rest of the leashes destined for the X shaft at the back of the loom. I like to count out all my leashes before arranging them in a logical way for threading. A valuable dividend of this approach is that mistakes are easy to find, whether in threading or earlier when winding the warp. Here are the leashes after they've been threaded in situ on five bars hung at the back of the loom. All the leashes for my blue stripes are on one headling bar at the front of the pack. Behind this, on a second headling bar, are the leashes for my orange stripes. At the back of the pack are my three X shafts hung from shaft holders. All my remaining leashes are arranged on these in a straight threading to spread them out a bit from one another. This makes it really easy to see what I'm doing when I am distributing the leashes from the headling bars to the pattern shafts. Here are the four groups of heddles associated with the mirrored blue stripes. Using the mirror head method, I will start at the outer edges of each group, selecting one leash from each and transferring them to my pattern shafts as I go. This is a straightforward task since all the other leashes are safely out of the way at the back. I timed it. It took me less than half an hour to deploy leashes on my first 24 pattern shafts, although I did subsequently decide to change the direction of the first stripe to make the poles more logical. With that out of the way, it was time to address the leashes for the orange stripes on the second headling bar. This brings me to tip number two. Mark your leashes as you thread your heddles. Since during this process one is counting like crazy anyway, it makes sense for all that attention to do double duty. I always consider my threading diagram to see where the key leashes are. Often, these are the first ones that will be moved onto a pattern shaft. At the very least, I mark all my turning points with a big floppy yarn bow so they will be easy to see later on. I also mark any other crucial waypoints or where I notice that mistakes have been made, where threads and a leash might be missing, for example. For my orange stripes here, I marked the foremost leashes on all six points. For repeated points, I would probably mark the rearmost turning points too to help me check my work. This foresight means that when I'm distributing leashes down the road, I don't have to count units at the back beam, something I find confusing and stressful, especially when I am dealing with finer threads and a wide warp. Which brings me to tip number three. When deploying pattern leashes, stay calm and give yourself plenty of time. I cannot emphasize this enough. 
Take a break and look at pictures of cats if you have to, or make yourself a cup of tea. <sighs> but with these precautions in place, I guarantee a much less painful process. Tip number four. Where possible, thread your leashes on pattern shafts rather than a headling bar. I learned this trick when I was setting up double weave on the draw loom, and now I use it in some way or another on almost every warp. It saves so much time, you won't believe it. In this case, once I'd transferred my orange points to their shafts, all I had left to deal with were my X-shaft leashes. I turned to face them, and there they were, all nicely arrayed before me on their three pattern shafts. All I had to do was remove each shaft from the supports and hang it on the waiting cords. The work of a minute. Tip number five. If you can, leave space between the rearmost pattern shaft and the X shaft or shafts. This makes logical redeployment of the leashes much easier if it is found to be necessary down the road. The cords for additional pattern shafts are easily accessible and the X shafts are well out of the way when wrangling leashes around the setup. Tip number six, don't be afraid to move leashes as your mood or design requirements take you. While it is possible to gather up all your leashes and start over, I find with arrangements like this, big effects can often be had with only a few changes. In my case, I decided about halfway through my first piece that my cloth would look awesome covering books. The spine fell naturally in the center of the warp, and I thought it would be cool to weave text vertically to show when the book was shelved. My setup already allowed that with its single threading up the middle of the warp. But for subsequent books, my setup was too limiting. What if I wanted to weave the author's name up the spine and the title up the front? What if I wanted to turn the warp sideways and have different motifs marching across the blue stripes? With the leashes for my four mirrored stripes all on the same group of pattern shafts for efficiency's sake, such versatility was not possible. I needed to separate these leashes from the rest if I wanted to maximize the pattern possibilities for my book cloth. One of the great strengths of draw looms is the ease with which such changes can be made. It was made even easier in this case because of the leeway that I'd given myself at leash distribution time. All I needed to do was get the central six of these leashes onto shafts in the space that I'd left myself here. I marked the first and last of the leashes I wanted to move with yarn bows to keep myself from getting confused. I also marked the leashes next door, the ones that would need to be got off the shaft and out of the way before redistribution could begin. Here we go. The first thing to do is gather up our leashes. I always do this if I am moving more than one or two at a time. Any length of yarn or string will do. Choke ties work great. I carefully pass the tie through each leash in order, front to back or back to front doesn't matter. I'm sure not to miss any or string them out of order. When it's done, there's a nice little bundle that can be taken anywhere. I tie it off to preserve my diligence. I do the same thing with any other groups of leashes that I want to move. Here, I needed to do the outer stripe so I could easily get it out of the way and back to where it belonged once the move was over. When that was done, I had two bundles of leashes carefully preserved and ready for the next step. At this point, I unhook one end of each pattern shaft and remove the bundle of leashes. Here I am, sliding the first bundle off each shaft in turn. When that's done, it feels pretty daring to drop the bundle between the shafts and into oblivion. Now, there's nothing in the way of the leashes I want to move, and that bundle comes off the shafts too. When that's done, I can reach in underneath and draw the entire bundle through to the back of the pack. Voila! Next. I thread my leashes one by one onto the six new shafts I have standing by and attach them to the waiting pull cords. In no time at all, they are where they need to be, ready to weave something new. Of course, I do have to remember also to replace the leashes I set aside while all this kerfuffle was going on. <laughs> 
practical upshot of all of this is that my blue stripe can now be woven independently from the rest without sacrificing the efficiency of pulling a single handle for the remaining three. Pattern leashes on a shaft draw loom are a powerful design tool. We can employ as few or as many as we like and arrange or rearrange them in creative ways to maximize their potential. By exploiting the possibilities of pattern shafts, we can save time and minimize mistakes while weaving exceedingly complex patterns on our cloth. They're amazing, and their use is limited only by our imaginations. <laughs>